A very good morning to everyone present here. I, Priyanka Singh, and myself, Kushbu Rani, welcome you all to the International Conference on Virus Evolution, Infection, and Disease Control, organized by School of Life Sciences, University of Hyderabad. University of Hyderabad has a beautiful campus, which is the home to a wide variety of flora and fauna. It is regarded as the lung space of Hyderabad. University of Hyderabad is an epicenter to world-class learning and research. Through various fundamental and applied research across disciplines, University of Hyderabad has made immense contributions to science with societal impact. Several national and international conferences are held throughout the year, which provides an opportunity 
to the students and researchers to discuss and acquire an extensive knowledge of various research topics. This international conference on virus evolution, infection and disease control uh, is an excellent platform to debate on the insights in the latest virology research. We would like to thank the experts in the field present here today who will be enriching us with their knowledge. Now I would like to request our Honorable Chief Guest, Dr. Manmohan Parida Sir and our Vice Chancellor, Professor B.J. Rao Sir to please come on the desk and take their chairs. Next, I would like to request Dean, School of Life Sciences, Professor and Shivakumar Sir to please come to the dais and take his chair. Now, I would like to request the in-charge head of the Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, Professor Niaz Ahmed Sir, to please come to the dais and take his chair. Finally, I would like to request the convener of the conference, Dr. M. Venkat Ramna sir, to please come to the desk and take his chair. We extend our warm welcome to all of you. Now we would like to grace the honorable dignitaries with the flower. So for that I would like to request Ms. Avantika, Ms. Prabha and Ms. Jyoti to present flower mementos to the honorable dignitaries. Professor Niaz Ahmad, uh, Head by Technology by Informatics Department, and all the delegates, my colleagues, and students uh, who are here. I, I welcome all of you to the uh, conference, the deep international conference on <coughs> virus evolution, infection, and disease control. So, this conference team started with the help of the Professor Vice Chancellor, Professor Bijera, Vice Chancellor University and the, in evolving the uh, team of Professor Jagan Pengwala is uh, helped us so much. So in the conference nearly 200 uh, delegates are, uh, are registered, uh, 50 speakers are there and uh, 50 posters are there, uh, rest of the are participants <coughs> and around 10 speakers are there from abroad uh, some of them are here like uh, professor vinayak prasad professor uh, kalpana ganjam and uh, professor uh, siddhappa and uh, professor saparna sanjar from sweden they are they will be here in, in a short way and i hope uh, your uh, three days conference will be uh, fruitful and the helpful for your uh, uh, career and all the best for your stay and uh, welcome you all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, sir. Thank you for addressing our audience. Now we would like to request Professor Niaz Ahmed, sir, the in charge head of the department, to please give an outline of the Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics. Good morning to all of you. Uh, it is very uh, pleasing to notice that the, an international conference on virology and virus diseases. Uh, and their control uh, is being organized here at the aegis of the Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics with the permission of Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir, uh, the uh, Chief Guest, uh, Dr. Manmohan Parida, and Convener, Dr. Venkata Ramana, Dean Professor Shiv Kumar Garu. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce you to our department because you will be hosted here for a couple of days or three days I would request you to take out some time to visit the department and its constituent units. You see that the department is scattered all around in this building. So it will be difficult for you to locate exactly where the department is. But then this is the concept of the School of Life Sciences that all the labs, it is so for all other departments also, that they are distributed in this round building. And it is quite famous about this building that this is the only second building after the parliament house, which is a circular building. And therefore, uh, I think you will come back to where you started if you go in the concentric you know, hallways of our school. And around those hallways, you will find some of the units, the laboratories, the offices and all. And in together, you know, this is a beautiful arrangement. Within that, our department is one of the youngest. This was founded in 2008 uh, as an interdisciplinary department of biotechnology and bioinformatics in higher learning, uh, teaching, and inquiry. And the theme of the department has been, uh, you know, biomolecular structure function dynamics in health and disease. And uh, that time we used to offer uh, two flagship programs uh, at the postgraduate teaching level: the masters in biotechnology, which was generously supported and still today it is being supported by the Department of Biotechnology of the Indian government. And another was the MTech Bioinformatics, which we are still uh, running. This was supported by the AICTE and also the university. So these are two of our flagship programs. Other than that, we have also been uh, directing a course on uh, IMSC Systems Biology. So these three master's courses and the doctoral programs were administered since the beginning. Uh, until recently when the system biology department got separated and now we are having you know two masters program and our integrated msc phd program and, uh, and the doctoral program 12 independent research groups around 12 faculty members uh, are actually constituting this department and since 2008 we have grown you know uh, i'll not say leaps and bounds but we have reasonably grown around 150 plus uh, international publications have emanated from the efforts of the faculty and crores worth of the extramural funding was actually administered in the department. And uh, you know, more than uh, uh, 50 PhD theses have been completed during this last 15 years of very good quality. And many of our students who pass from this department have been uh, actually appointed at quite respectable positions and they are very proud alumni of our department. So this is indeed a, a very good opportunity for all of us to uh, be in this department and also get benefit of our leadership of the university. And that you will see in the form of this conference, uh, which is uh, going to be a very uh, timely event and a very, uh, you know, very much uh, critical uh, event given that the virus diseases are all, all around of us. The viruses are having the broadest of the host range and every now and then the exotic viruses and those who have been, you know, uh, until now restricted to the animal kingdom or elsewhere in the exotic species are finding their ways to come to the human communities. So this is the very right time for discussing these ideas as to how to tackle them as a national priority and also at, at the international level. And I wish from the side of the department a very best, uh, you know, or, or a very good success to this conference. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Sir, for the overview of Department of Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, we now request Professor N. Shivakumar, sir, Dean School of Life Sciences, to please tell a few words of our school. 
very good morning to one and all. Uh, the distinguished uh, dignitaries on the dais, Mr. Vijay Raghavar, Vice Chancellor, the guest of honor, uh, Dr. Manmohan Garu, Head uh, Biotechnology Department, and convener of the meeting, uh, Dr. Venkatramana. Faculty colleagues, international speakers, speakers who are coming from within India, and student friends. I'm very happy to be here this morning as the Dean School of Life Sciences to talk about the School of Life Sciences, which is one of the largest schools in the University of Hyderabad. And this place is one of the most happening place in the university scientifically. Almost every day, there is some or the other academic activity going on in this university, other than the regular course curriculum. We get a lot of visitors. We get a lot of uh, foreign visitors as well. And we interact with the students for seminars and so on. So the School of Life Sciences is divided into five independent departments. They are the Biochemistry Department, Plant Sciences Department, Animal Biology Department, Biotechnology and Bioinformatics, and the recently formed Systems and Computation Biology Department. So each of the department offers the master's program and PhD program, and with the NEP 2020 in place right now from this academic year, we also started all integrated master's program in putting students at plus two level, soon after the plus two level. So these, all the faculty are well trained in different areas of research and this particular conference, which is focusing at the very right time, we have just ended up with the COVID-19 and new viruses are also emerging out each time. And I'm very sure that the deliberations of this conference from all the speakers as well as the interactions with colleagues will help understand, update the knowledge in this area and also look for new uh, methodologies and techniques that could help to detect any type of virus. I wish this uh, conference a grand success. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving us an opportunity to know more about our School of Life Sciences. Now I would like to request our Vice Chancellor, Professor B.J. Rao sir, to please give the inaugural speech. Good morning to all of you. My special warm welcome to Manmohan Paritaji from Collier and uh, Professor uh, Niyaz Ahmadji. Kumarji and uh, uh, The title of this conference, three-day conference, is a wholesome title. It's on virus evolution, infection, and disease control. And this was a very well thought out title uh, because this covers almost entire uh, biology of viral world. Viruses are actually meant here for, not for disease, but for evolution. Because viruses are very, very stable particles. They are ubiquitous. They are everywhere on earth. And outside living system, they are extremely stable. Well packaged genetic material they are extremely well decorated with very, with very, very interesting architectures on their surfaces. They are so beautiful to look at. Whenever something is so beautiful, it must be functionally very relevant. Otherwise, nature would not evolve beauty just for that. So viruses are extremely beautiful to look at. Variety of shapes and variety of projections, beautifully symmetric. So they are not simply particles, but they are particles meant for doing interesting things. So they enter into host cells, and they do a fascinating thing called sabotaging host machinery. And entire virology, virology more or less, is to understand how viruses sabotage existing host machinery, even tinker host machinery towards its own benefit, and come out extremely successfully. Within a short period, a single viral particle that enters brings out several hundreds of viral particles totally intact and functional. So this is a very beautiful design of propagation of genetic material. 
I think there is no other system that can do this so well. Having done this, they just don't leave as good guests. They actually leave the remnants. This is where the story starts. They leave the remnants of their genetic material in all of us, in all the hosts. This I find very fascinating because there is a purpose in this now. If the guest comes and leaves a, a piece of his, his or her luggage in your home, not by forgetfulness but by purpose, that biology becomes very, very exciting. It is this biology actually did the evolution of the placenta that all of mammals use. Can you imagine this? We are all placentals because the virus came and tinkered with us genetically and we became placental animals. This can be as profound as that. I find this is fascinating. So more or less about 7, 8, 9, 10 percent of our genomes are virus genomes in bits and pieces, strategically placed, tinkering us, tinkering our biology. They gave placenta to us in a very, very significant manner. They also give very, very robust immune protection in certain parasitism. They go and sabotage the immune system of the host in a very, very robust manner. So they do multiple things. They do for their benefit, viral benefit. They also do for host benefit. It's a zero-sum game. Sometimes virus wins, sometimes the host wins. So I think we have not fully understood the viral uh, genome impact on the host genome very, very well yet. Because we have chosen, we have picked up, we have, we have I think, uh, discovered a few examples. The whole world of uh, viral genomes into the host system is still un unexplored. Most of us carry viruses, most hosts carry viruses, viral bits and pieces of genomes. In fact, it is nobody has done a wholesome survey of how and where viral genomes are left behind in the host genome, in plants, in fungi, in a lot of animal species, etc. etc. So the, the obsession for us in virology was to understand how viral, viral systems sabotage us, that's number one. And number two is the disease, because we are obsessed with our diseases, obviously. We want to live longer, we want to be healthier, that's our obsession. In the process of this obsession, we have not really, really investigated the other parts of viral uh, impact in our, in our physiology. There's a whole lot that is to be discovered. The recent uh, COVID-2 story gave us a good alert that they can jump around zoonotically. This was, was to happen. This is, this is completely natural. Whether it came from a lab or from a bag, it is completely natural that things have to jump. Nobody is stable here. So these kind of uh, infections called COVID infections, and other uh, debilitating infections are, have been happening for a long time, several centuries. If you look at the history of pandemics, this is not the first time, this will not be the last time, this will keep happening. And therefore, the viruses come and give us the alert call, look, I'm here, don't forget me. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, the, the biology of virus systems have impacted humanity very, very significantly for a very long time. And uh, we will always be busy looking at the mechanisms as to how viruses uh, come and impact our physiology in multiple ways. Perhaps in a very tissue-specific manner, they impact our biology. We still do not know the tissue specificity of viral impacts on our systems. We generally learn in bits and pieces as the diseases come and hit us. 
So uh, I believe that this conference uh, with its wholesome title, Evolution, Infection, Disease Control, is a very uh, welcome uh, uh, event at this time, soon after COVID uh, pandemic. And the way we start the evolution, I think will form the fulcrum on which we will try to understand infection and then of course the disease and disease control, etc, etc. This is a three day celebrations where uh, we would uh, uh, learn from various uh, real practicing virologists. I just saw Professor Prasad walking in. Thank you coming by. And I think uh, Kalpana Ganjam also is there. These are very, very good friend of mine and I'm sure yours also. And this particular theme will give us a, a lot of food for thought as well as uh, new ideas for us to proceed further in trying to understand viruses, not just the stable genetic particles, but particles which are extremely smart in tinkering the host in good as well as bad ways. And in the process, they turn out to be the best robust, robust genetic carriers between animal species in a very large, wholesome manner. At a population level, of course, this becomes a very uh, dynamic situation. We do not know how multiple viral systems can impact hosts and how viral systems can transmit between plants and animals, completely unclear, and between different uh, animal species. There is a lot to learn from these uh, interesting particles, which of course captivate our attention by the way they present to us, so beautifully designed. Everywhere you look at virus, it's so symmetrical. So, the so beautifully designed, I think we should study everything that is so beautiful in this world. Viruses actually offer that, that, that opportunity in a, very, in a very meaningful manner. So I, I don't want to belabor my point again and again. I just have a very short inaugural talk, which I just did. And uh, we will proceed further. Uh, I hope all these uh, lectures will be recorded. Please do record all these lectures so that we can, we can learn from these lectures uh, even outside this setting. Okay, thank you very much and all the best to this conference in the coming three days. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening words. We would now, now like to request Dr. Insaf Qureshi, sir, to please introduce the chief guest. Chief guest, Dr. Manmohan Parida, who is a renowned virologist and also working as director of CDRI, oh sorry, DRDE Gwalior. His core areas of research encompasses strategic biodefense research and development with significant contribution in the field of rapid detection technologies, antiviral drug development, new generation vaccine candidates, and trafficking of emerging viruses of biomedical importance. Notably, he has also established National Apex Referral Laboratory for Dengue, Chikungunya, Swine Flu, COVID-19 under Infectious Disease Surveillance Program. He is spearheading the DRDO by threat mitigation program and working on establishment of maximum microbial contaminant complex PSL4 facility as a national biodefense referral laboratory in the country for the mitigation of future biothreat emergencies. He has also established advanced molecular diagnostic based on gene amplification technologies like RT-PCR and RT-LAMP 
for large number of viruses including dengue, chikungunya, West Nile virus, this swine flu virus and SARS-CoV-2. He has also developed the test and evaluation facility for testing the biosuits and biomasks. In addition, he has also developed field deployable mobile containment laboratory for, for rapid on-site detection which was also used for testing of COVID-19 samples during the recent pandemic at Mysore Medical College. He has published more than 140 research articles in peer-reviewed journals with H index of 43 and supervised many PhD students. He has three international patents and 10 international patents granted to his credit. He has he was ranked among top 10 researchers in the field of immunology and microbiology as per DST L7 bibliometric analysis 2009-2014. He is also ranked among top 2% of scientists of the world in the field of biomedical research. All his sincere efforts are being recognized through various national awards including DRDO Scientist of the Year Award, DRDO Technology Group Award, ICMR Basanti Devi Amir Chand Prize, DVT National Bioscience Award, DST Technology Commercialization Award, and NASI Reliance Platinum Jubilee Award. Moreover, he is also the Fellow of Indian Biological Society. With these words, sir, I request you to address the candidate. Thank you, sir. of the dais, eminent biologist from the country as well as from overseas, distinguished academicians, uh, learned faculty members of University of Hyderabad, delegates and participants of this international conference and my dear students. Good morning to one and all. I think I am privileged to be part of this international conference being organized by University of Hyderabad which is just in time and it is very, very, at a very critical juncture in the post-COVID pandemic scenario. Actually, where this is the, this conference will provide the ideal platform to do the brainstorming or to do the churning of what lessons we have learned from our COVID-19 pandemic and what should we do for our strategic countermeasures for mitigation of future biological emergencies. I think the theme of this conference, virus evolution, infection, and disease control, it is very, very pertinent as we uh, know that in the face of this COVID pandemic, it is needless, needless to highlight the importance of virus evolution. I think how the variants of concern, they have increased the virulence of this circulating viruses and how the pandemic was progressing, that I think all of us, we know it. And this virus evolution, it is a slow and natural process. I think as Professor Rao was telling, excellent architecture, which is very good and stable. And it is the evolution or mutation that happens, it is a very slow and natural process. But of late, this has become a concern because of the rapid mutation and resulting into new, new variants with increased virulence. So, of course, as we ourselves are responsible for this thing because of our massive urbanization, rapid air travel, and change in lifestyles. So, emerging infections are coming in day to day of our life and creating the problem for the society. The most important in life science research is the technology that we are using. It is of dual use concern. It is double-edged sword. 
like the same technology which you can be used for the vaccine development that can also be used to create a new or hybrid virus with more virulence for, uh, uh, for uh, summer test operations. So the intention that actually matters, how we are using the technology. And moreover, in addition to the viruses that are circulating in the our own agroclimatic, diverse agroclimatic conditions, there again there is a threat also from the tailor-made or we can say advanced biowarfare agents. Because now with the technological advancement in the post-genomic era, we are using the our technology, say recombinant DNA technology, as well as the gene editing technology to make synthetic viruses or to create viruses for a particular purpose which can baffle the all kind of conventional diagnostics as well as therapeutics. That is the, again another problem which is going to again create much more problem in the future. So when, as Professor Rao has told, pandemics are there, pandemics were there, pandemics is there and pandemics will also be there. So then what should be our preparedness? Because I think all will agree with me, this COVID-19 pandemic has caught us unprepared in all front, whether it is the logistics, whether it is the diagnostics, whether it is the vaccines or the drug development. So we are actually caught in such a situation that the country has, not only India, across the globe we have suffered a lot. So now what should be our preparedness for such type of pandemics in future? Because you cannot discount that in future the pandemic which is coming, which will come, it will be much more devastating than the COVID pandemic. So our preparedness should focus on now because in a country like India where our, we have the diverse populations and they are again we are sharing the same ecological habitat. Actually in our case the same ecological habitat is being shared by the uh, our domestic animals where the virus is sub, remains in its natural reservoir. So because of mutation, so they are crossing the species barrier and coming to the human population and causing the diseases as we have seen the swine flu, then Vipa and the COVID-19 virus which has again known was in the back. So these viruses are definitely going to come. But then what should be our strategies? How we should prepare ourselves to tackle this kind of emergencies? I think that should be the point of discussion for this conference, international conference. So if you exactly remember during COVID-19, we have faced a lot of difficulties in terms of critical infrastructure, in terms of the logistics like the uh, uh, reagent, critical reagents and the PPE kits, masks, the consumables, the reagents and technologies also and the vaccines as well as the drugs. So now first we will discuss let us about the critical infrastructure. Actually, although we in the country we have now lot many containment laboratories, but still we are the magnitude of the cases that we have actually encountered during COVID pandemic, it was difficult to handle by the normal routine laboratories. So we need more and more containment laboratories to be built up across the globe across the countries, in different parts of the country. Of course, now ICMR has taken initiative to make establish the virus research diagnostic VRDL laboratories in almost all medical colleges. But that was not even sufficient to tackle the condition, emergency situations. So we have to establish more and more containment facilities and also not only BSL-3 laboratories. I think more focus should be given on BSL-2 plus laboratories with appropriate biosafety and biosecurity control measures so that without posing any threat to the communities and also to protect our the healthcare workers as well as the first responders. And also we should have more and more BSL-4 facilities because in our country only NIV is the having only BSL-4 facilities. So which was again handicapped to do the more advanced R&D like the challenge studies and the other uh, vaccines related uh, studies. So that is why we should have more and more BSL-4 laboratories in our countries. Because if you look over the globes, I think in the USA itself they have 15 BSL-4 laboratories. And in China also, again they have 5 to 6 BSL-4 laboratories and planning another 5 to 6 
which will be operational by 2025. So in India, with so much population, we have only one laboratory. So I think we have to improve our critical infrastructure in terms for the safe and secure handling of this new viruses and particularly the unknown viruses because we are never sure that tomorrow this viruses whatever it is going to come we have the idea about our prior knowledge about these viruses so we should have developed the capability to identify any kind of known uh, 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 high consequence as well as unknown agents also so that should be our priority once we have the critical infrastructure to handle for safe and secure handling of these agents, the next question comes the diagnosis. How to diagnose it first? So here actually we have so many technologies we are developing, but none of them could come to the market, commercialized. So what we need actually, the affordable, user-friendly, rapid and robust detection technologies, which can be used in the, not only in the laboratory, in peripheral healthcare center, of course, in COVID time, we could say that rapid antigen detection test that was used in the peripheral healthcare center, and PCR was the mainstay of the referral laboratories. So, in future, we although the, the several technology has been come out, developed, like the CRISPR Cas technologies or like LAMP technologies, but none of them could see the market or the, uh, day of the light because. No industries were coming forward to take these technologies and commercialize it because it should be affordable also because price is the main deciding factor. So industries has also to join hand along with the academicians or with the technologists and the scientists to do more value addition in terms of making it more ruggedized, robust and field deployable with affordable cost. So that is another aspect where actually we should work along by joining our hands with the industries to take this problem so that in future if any emergency comes we have sufficient uh, background industry partner with us who can take the risk and produce the reagents in bulk so that are available for the to meet the requirement of course we are very good in clinical diagnosis but Another aspect which we are lacking that is the environmental diagnosis. How to, because always that it is not that virus, before coming to the human being, virus is always there in the environment, in natural host, the reservoir, in the soil, in the uh, water. So that also our focus to uh, enhance our detection capability in the soil, water, the typical peacetime surveillance. When there is no activity, virus remains in the resilience. So that time also we should detect them. Then, as a part of early warning system, we can forecast that when the epidemic is going to come, when the pandemic is going to come, and what should be our control measures and strategies. So we can forecast in a better way, we can do the modeling studies. So that part is again, we are lacking it. So this again demands multidisciplinary approach. It is not that only virologist or biologist, they will address these issues. Because for that we need to actually the tunable or field amenable detectors, sensors, so that it can detect non-invasive technologies without much sample processing, if you can detect. So that I have discussed in my subsequent lecture that how we are preparing, what is the international scenario, what is our national scenario capability. So that front also we are again 20, 30 years back. Even at international level also there is no foolproof technologies. Here actually that is what no single technology is foolproof. We need a battery of technologies to complement each other. So that is why the R&D should continue with more efforts on the detection technologies, which can be easily affordable and use detection capability, unambiguous detection capability. Once we detect, then comes of course the protection. Protection again here, as you have seen in during COVID pandemics, as I have told, one is the physical protection that how to protect our first responder healthcare workers from this because once the virus becomes aerosolized. So we have to protect also that I think during COVID time, even the basic things were not available, the sanitizer, which is the basic thing it was not available to the general public. Even the PP kits, the mask. So it was very tough time for the government also to mobilize the industries 
and we are not sure about the quality because during pandemic again there is exploitation of the market potential so industries they also claim lot many false uh, they have come up with the false claims tall claims which needs to be certified again i think during 2014 ebola uh, international health emergencies that time we are looking for the bio suit which can protect it should be liquid impermeable but breathable suit so this was imported by uh, dupont and other uh, uh, companies but there was no test or facility and evaluation facility to certify that they are serving the real purpose so that is why that time icm or health minister the interministerial coordination meeting and uh, drdo we have been given the task to establish this test and evaluation facility since we are dealing with the nbc suits so that is why again we have that time established the synthetic blood resistance penetration test and then dry bacterial penetration test at the laboratory level so during covid pandemic this instruments we have taken overnight from gwalior to delhi because during lockdown industries are finding difficult to come to gwalior so there are again 24 into 7 these instruments are being used to test all the pp because we have the industries they can develop this fabrics even this fabrics are also now we can make in india but the main important critical is the stitching technology the lamination technologies so where most of the pp kit they are filling in the joint or the stitching portions so that again so we have learned lot of uh, from this our efforts so now we are establishing this test and nabl accredited with bis standard so that is again required because what test and evaluation facility to certify that whatever gadgets are being the medical devices is developed that is also up to the mark as per although there is no international standard iso standard but at least the we should have our own standard to certify these things so that effort should also continue and of course again vaccines and drugs again because as you have seen with a lot of uh, incentives and push from the government we could make the vaccines in 100 days again it was possible because the industries they have come forward and they have taken the uh, with the collaboration with the uh, uh, national institutes so we could i think this is a landmark in where you could make the vaccine in 100 days time period so i think oh, that is so we have the capability but what is required that we have to timely mobilize this resource and coordinate among all the agencies which is totally missing in our country because we all are working in isolation so but when it comes to the national priority all should join hand and devise the strategies to tackle such type of emergencies in future so this is what actually i think this was this conference i think it has given the ideal platform to all the virologists eminent virologists so they should share the knowledge and their uh, collaboration should be more strengthened and i think university of hyderabad i think it is a provided excellent platform i am happy to know that it is recognized as institute of eminence and it has the ideal ecological r&d system ecosystem because what the government is now pressing that we have to create an ideal uh, r&d ecosystem by making a synergy between the uh, institutes national institutes university and academia and the industry in our drdo we are formulating a policy now government has encouraged we call dia that is drdo industry and academia so we have made some center of excellence across the iits and the national universities i think university of hyderabad also we have one center of excellence in bhu also we have made one center of excellence then iit chennai madras mumbai delhi and so they are rurki so we have the center of excellence so here actually we are funding ourselves to develop the technologies because now in drd also we have our in addition to life science research board we have made a technology development board technology development fund where the industries can if they have the technology readiness level above 6 they can approach then drd will fund every all the cost including manpower and everything so we can take up to 50 crores of uh, uh, fund for that and you can develop the technologies so finance is not a constant money is not a constant there are even uh, dst and uh, other dbt they are also giving the money but only thing we should come forward and we should work now the publications okay that as uh, dr rao has told we have to understand the intricacies 
or into the insights of this virus evolution and understand and devise our own strategies. But at both uh, at the genetic level, so the gene silencing technologies, or maybe by de designing the uh, critical subunit vaccines by targeting the conserved regions of the viruses of a panel or the spectrum for develop a broad spectrum vaccines as well as the antivirals, so that that can be used at the time of any emergencies. So with this what I wish uh, that this conference will provide this uh, three days conference we will have lot of debate and discussion about these strategies and we will equip ourselves with good knowledge because knowledge is the best antidote to counter measure or to counteract this kind of future emergencies. So I wish all the best to the, all the participants. I think this will be a good takeaway uh, from the, uh, uh, by the virologists who are working engaged in this field to go back and again do the uh, realign their research to come out with deliver in time. Because yes, we are capable, but the requirement is we have to deliver in time. Otherwise, your research has no meaning. So publication and patent nowadays, nobody is giving any importance. Even our assessment also, it is categorically told that publication and as this patent as we have to come out with the deliverables, the technology, which has a potential spin-off benefit for the society. Because ultimately, the science we are doing it is the uh, poor man's taxpayers' money, so it is for the society. So we have to work for the benefit of the society by devising our own strategies for countering this kind of pandemics. Thank you. We wish you all the best. Thank you, sir, for your motivating words. We request Dr. Madhuri Subhaya, ma'am, from the National Institute of Animal Biology to give vote of thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you all. It is uh, giving me an immense pleasure to actually say the vote of thanks for today. And uh, this is on behalf of the conference organizers. Our special thanks to our chief guest, Dr. Manmohan Parida, and for the great lecture he has just given and for the lecture that we are going to listen uh, during the conference. And uh, uh, very much thank you, sir, for gracing us with your presence when you are in the PC schedule. And a special thanks to our VC, University of Hyderabad, Professor B.J. Rao, sir, for his constant support and guidance for arranging this conference. And a special thanks to all the on the stage and all the participants, uh, because you are the strength of this conference. I hope all of you enjoy the conference uh, as well as gain knowledge out of it. And have a pleasant stay at Hyderabad. Uh, thank you. One day, Mark. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, with this, we end our inaugural session. And now I would like to request all our guests, our audience, to gather outside the conference hall for a group photo session, followed by a tea break. We will resume our second session shortly after 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Let's uh, break for the tea, then uh, the session two follows immediately. Thank you. Within 10 15 minutes. Please. speakers for the coming session to please uh, update their presentation with the organizers. We are still waiting for two more presentations for the next session.
Good morning to all the dignitaries and delegates. Now let's begin the second session of the ICBI DC 2022. The title of the session is Viral Pathogen and Evolution, and the session will be chaired by Dr. Manmohan Parida, Director of Defense Research and Development Establishment, and Professor N. Siva Kumar, Dean School of Life Science, University of Hyderabad. Sir, I humbly request both of you to come over to the dais and chair the session. Good morning to one and all. Welcome to the first technical session of this international conference on virus evolution, infection and disease control. I think the first session, the theme of this first technical session is viral pathogens and evolution. So we have five lectures for this technical session. One is the plenary lecture and the other four will be given by the uh, different scientists from uh, virologists. They are working in uh, mainly on the viral hemorrhagic fevers, dengue, and uh, um, the first lecture, so the preparation lecture, this will be on HIV um, biology. So, uh, Professor Ganja Kalpana, she will be delivering the plenary session lecture on structural mimicry between HIV-1 TAR RNA and the host factor uh, for the development of novel therapeutics and virus viral evolution. I request Professor Sivkumar to introduce another it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Professor Kalpana this morning. She is uh, working in the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York City. Her research interests are the role of INH, HNS, and SMR, RCV1 in HIV replication and human cancers. She has been an outstanding scientist with uh, 82 publications in peer reviewed journals such as Nature Medicine, EMBO Journal. PNAS, General of Virology, Oncogene, and so on. I now invite uh, Professor Ganjami Kalpana to deliver her talk, please. thus far 
And um, so during this evolution, lots of changes have to take place. The viruses have to adapt to the new system, human system, the cells, and uh, they have to uh, overcome the restrictions that are present in the cell. It does it by the acquiring new uh, characters. One of the characters um, is by protein-protein interaction between the host virus, uh, virus and the host proteins. I'll talk to you about one of the host virus interactions today. So that is the interaction between the host factor in one and HIV-1 integrase. So this, we have uh, discovered that um, um, in E1 binds to HIV-1 integrase, but it doesn't bind to HIV-2 or HIV, suggesting that this has happened after these uh, HIV has evolved from the SIV. So what is any one? So any one is a eukaryotic protein, which is a component of the multi-protein complex called the Swysniff complex. So Swysniff complex is a um, 9 to 10 protein, 9 to 11 protein complexes. The, as a unit, these complexes are involved in chromatin remodeling. What they do is they reorganize and reposition the nucleosome in such a way that it will open up the chromatin to allow the transcription factor binding and a few other functions. So they are not limited to just uh, uh, transcription uh, uh, regulation, but they also are important for DNA repair, DNA replication, recombination, and also involved in alternate splicing. So they have a, a major role in many functions, including development, as well as interferon regulation. They are also one of the most frequently affected tumor suppressors in human cancers. And their mutations is also found in intellectual disability disorder. So this was discovered by, um, by me um, a long time ago as a protein that binds to HIV-1 integrase. So let's talk about what is HIV-1 integrase. And um, so HIV-1 is an retrovirus. And during its life cycle, HIV enters the cell through its receptor interaction. And where inside the RNA genome is converted into double-stranded DNA by a process of reverse transcription, this double-stranded DNA integrates. This process of joining the host chromosome um, is called the integration. So this is an essential step in the life cycle of all retroviruses. And after integration, the virus undergoes transcription, translation to make viral proteins and RNA and proteins combined together assemble to form the viral particle, mature virions. And uh, so studies of uh, integrase have suggested, so integrase is an enzyme that is encoded by the virus itself. It's present in the virus particle and it, its main function is to catalyze insertion of viral DNA into host chromosome. However, recent studies have suggested that it has an additional role. It plays an important role in what is called particle morphogenesis. So what you see here is an electron micrographic image of a HIV-1 particle with a typical cone-shaped capsid with the electron-dense genomic uh, material, uh, RNA protein complex inside. So when integrase are, is mutated, for some reason, these particles are not mature properly, they became defective, which is shown here, where the electrons dense material comes out of the capsid, and this is an empty capsid shell, and these particles are non-infectious. So one way to inhibit viral replication would be then to target integrate such a way that it will, uh, it will make the capsid defective, and the virus particles are not infectious anymore. So, uh, <coughs> The how, how integrase plays a role in capsid maturation is not completely understood. One of the mechanisms why this may lead to um, the defective morphogenesis is uh, through its ability to bind to HIV-1 RNA. This is the paper that came in 2016 where uh, they found that integrase mutants defective for binding to RNA form this empty capsid shells with the genomic RNA outside. So HIV-1 genomic RNA is highly structured, which is shown here, and the first 15 or so nucleotides are stem loop structures, which is 
uh, formed into a unit called TAR or transactivation response element. This element is extremely important for HIV-1 transcription. This TAR RNA binds to tag protein encoded by HIV-1 and leads to um, transcription and elongation. Without this um, tag binding to TAR, the transcription of HIV-1 is stalled at the initiation stage and it doesn't proceed anymore. So, but um, incidentally they found that this TAR is an element which also binds to HIV-1 integrase which is not involved in transcription but involved in integration. But that Def if there is defect in binding to this TAR, it leads to this defective particle morphogenesis. Specifically, they identified the mu residues, uh, lysine-264 and arginine-269 on integrase, which are important for binding to TAR. So this is the background. When, uh, so when we were studying how the host factor, integrase binding host factor, we also call it one influences HIV replication, we notice that the host factor is actually required for both the functions of integrase. On the one hand, because it's a component of the SpiceNet complex, it, ta it may target integration into transcriptionally active regions. On the other hand, we found that the mutations in the integrase can also lead to defect in binding to this host factor, which also may lead to particle morphogenesis. So let me uh, elaborate a little bit more. So, we have shown that any one, the host factor, is important for HIV-1 replication in two stages. One is when you don't have any one that is done by um, various different means, including dominant negative mutants, uh, using any one minus minus cell lines, or any one point mutations, or any one knockdown. So there is a disruption of binding of this integrase, which is the viral protein. These are viral gag poly polyprotein which is integrase is a part of it and anyone binds to this protein and if there is a disruption in this interaction then there is no particle production. However, if you have anyone in the cell intact but it is defective for binding to integrase because of integrase mutation, it leads to defective particles and these particles are non-infectious. Either way, anyone seems to be important for HIV-1 replication. And to understand the complexity, I'm not going to the details of all the uh, theories of work that we have done, but most recently, in order to understand the dynamic between interaction between the host factor in E1 and the HIV-1 integrase, we decided to look at the structure, structural interaction between these two proteins. And we saw the um, NMR structure of the fragment of E1, which is shown here, which has a repeat one and repeat two domains. Repeat one domain is necessary and sufficient to bind to integrase. And we solved the NMR structure of this fragment. And we found that it is a very nicely organized uh, helix loop, helix beta helix structure with a completely unordered, disordered uh, structure, which is the linker region, which is shown here. So this is highly ordered, but this is disordered. But this, this is important for uh, binding to its uh, uh, the proteins. And so this is the modeling of the full length structure. Basically, this is the important portion which binds to integrase. And when we, uh, so in order to understand how any one fragment, which is the repeat one domain, binds to HIV-1 integrase, we model the dot, the structures, of um, integrase, which is shown in this gold color, uh, which is the C-terminal domain of integrase, and the repeat one domain, that fragment that we uh, structurally defined. And we, to our surprise, we found that it is a very strong interaction between integrase, which is shown in blue, and any one, which is shown in pink, and there's a large area of interaction. And this interaction, also is defined by polar interactions, hydrophobic interactions, as well as a nice hydro buried hydrophobic channel between the two protein that reduces the energy of interaction. So uh, we identified residues at the interface of the integrase, which is blue, and any one, pink, and we were amazed to notice that many of the residues that are present in the interface are already known to be important for HIV-1 
function. And especially the two residues, lysine 264, arginine 269, or which are tightly um, positioned in the interface of the two proteins, are the same residues which were shown to be important for binding to RNA. So now we are looking at the interaction of the protein with integrase. And these are the two residues of integrase. The same two residues were also important for binding to RNA, the tau RNA. So how is this possible that, so um, <coughs> how is this possible for the same protein that is HRG1 integrase to bind to the host factor in one as well as the RNA using the same residues and same surface. So we, want, we wanted to confirm this is true and we used several biochemical reactions. One of the reaction is protein-protein and protein-RNA interaction studies using alpha assay. Alpha assay is a proximity-based assay a, a proximity bead based assay when uh, one of the proteins or RNA is bound to one of the beads and uh, the donor bead and the acceptor bead has the other protein. When the two proteins are uh, protein, and, protein and RNA interact with each other, it releases an uh, uh, oxygen radical which is short lived and it only transfer, travels for a very short time and when it binds to the acceptor bead, it elicits a, um, a light that can be monitored that can be read as a protein-protein interaction um, signal. And uh, we use the same, this system is very flexible, so you can use it not only for protein-protein, but also for protein-RNA interaction. So we use this system to study interaction of the HIV-1 integrase, which is the CTD domain, with the uh, ini one uh, repeat one domain, as well as the same integrase with tar rna and to our surprise, we found that the interactions are identical between the two. The integrase binding to repeat one, and also we tested the mutants of integrase which were in the interface of the, these two complex. The mutants that affect binding of integrase to any one also affected binding of integrase to TAR. So you can see the pattern there, identical. Not only that, we found that this uh, any one fragment repeat one as well as the tor rna compete with each other to bind into integrase so you can this is the competition assay using the same alpha acid reaction where we can add the constant amount of uh, integrase and the any one and increasing concentration of rna to see if it competes and vice versa constant amount of integrase and rna and increasing concentration of repeat one in both the cases the interaction was computer law. And um, so the laser is not working anymore. So it, you can see that there is a, a nice um, inhibition curve with the IC50 value of nanomolar, like 0.024 nanomolar uh, inter interaction, suggesting that these two molecules, that is, repeat one on the one hand and the tar RNA on the other hand, or binding to the same surface and they're competing with each other. So this is an indication that they are recognizing the same surface of um, same surface of integrase. So um, if that is the case, in more, that means the mutants of integrase that do not bind to any one also will not bind to RNA. That means they should show the same uh, phenotype. So we, I already uh, indicated to you that integrase mutants defective for binding to RNA leads to particle morphogenesis defect. So we asked the question if the integrase mutants in the interface of integrase and any one will also lead to the defect in particle morphogenesis. And that's exactly what we found. So we can see that this is a wild type and R228 is one of the residues in the interface between any one and integrase and when you have uh, arginine converted into alanine, you see that the particles are totally defective. Uh, there is an empty shell, and the nuclear dense material, electron dense material is outside the carbon shell. And not only that, so this is also uh, true in another mutant, W235, when uh, 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 W is converted into a charged residue, you see the same defect. Not only that, these mutants of integrase, when you incorporate it into virions and test for the infectivity of the virus using a reporter assay where positive infection leads to a 
GLP positive cell, you can see the wild type increasing amount of uh, infection is going on. However, if the same amount of virus is taken but it has a mutation in W235E, it is completely dead. Indicating that the interaction between integrase and these residues in the interface between any one um, are very important for viral replication. So then we ask the question, since any one and the tar RNA, they both are binding to the same surface of uh, integrase and they recognize the same residue, will they look similar in three-dimensional structure? So we model the two complexes. Two more minutes to conclude, madam. Okay. So model the two, um, the two structures. Uh, that is the uh, integrase with any one and integrase with RNA. We were amazed to see that they are actually uh, recognizing exactly the same surface in the modeling. And why? How do you understand this? Any one is a protein, whereas RNA is a. RNA is different from this protein. This is the NMR structure of RNA. When we look at the electrostatic distribution of the charges on the surface of any one, we immediately realize that the negatively charged amino acid residues on any one are positioned on the repeat one domain exactly similar to the phosphate groups which are on the RNA structure. So this is the three-dimensional structure of the, these two proteins where the negatively charged residues and phosphate groups are highlighted. So based on all these studies, we, for the first time, we propose that anyone is a repeat one is an RNA mimic. So this is what is very exciting because um, RNA mimicry um, exists in nature, but it's rare. But also it is, RNA mimicry has been observed for the cellular proteins. For example, in this case, it's the RNA mimicry between bacterial EFP protein to a tRNA. This is the tRNA and this is the protein. This is the mimicry between these two. And also there are RNA uh, assembly factors. So this is a protein uh, in yeast called SHQ, which is a protein which mimics actually RNA. They don't exactly look like that, but the uh, charge distribution is similar and they perform similar function. So uh, because of all that, um, we think that uh, ours is the first report of a RNA from virus mimicking a cellular protein. And this uh, elicits many questions, including what's the functional evolution and significance of HIV-1? Does any one domain mimic a cellular RNA? Or can we use RNA mimicry to develop novel class of anti-HIV drugs? In fact, we have. So I'm going to quickly go through. We actually superimposed RNA with the repeat one protein and how, found how they bind to HIV integrase. And we found that there's an alpha helix at the interface of any one. So this alpha helix is shown here, and we developed what is called staple peptide, and we tested to see how this staple peptide affects RNA interaction as well as protein interaction. This pep peptide derived from any one not only inhibits any integrase any one interaction, also integrates RNA interaction, and it also inhibits viral replication, and it induces defective particles as shown here. So in fact, this leads to a development of a novel class of HIV-1 inhibitors. And so we are in the process of further evaluating it. Perhaps we can take to uh, the clinical trials in a few years. And um, so I'm not going to spend time on conclusion other than saying that viruses have evolved to, in so many different ways, and one way is by mimicking the host factors. And in this case, the viral RNA is evolved to mimic host protein and for its function. And this is uh, my group. And uh, various people are involved in the uh, studies that I propose, uh, specifically Upadesh, Rajiv, Zhuhong, and Savita is the modeler. And I also thank various people at Albert Einstein College and uh, um, in US for collaboration for the structural studies. Thank you very much. I really appreciate listening to you. Thank you very much for coming in on time. Uh, now the topic is open for discussion. Yes. Alpana, if you can set up an in vitro RNA evolution experiment yes. and design an assay to compete, integrate, integrate with INNOVA. Yes. 
So you in vitro evolve an RNA. Would that mimic the RNA that we have naturally here? I think so. I, I would I totally agree with that. You can use aptamers, for example, aptamer assay. It's literally the same. It's a library of millions of aptamers, RNA mo molecules folded into different shapes. And if you allow it to bind to integrase and select it out multiple, I, I'm sure it would mimic anyone and it would be like thar RNA. And it would probably compete with anyone. So that is a feasible, uh, feasible yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. Yes. The other one, can you bring in RNA and functionally mimic the uh, the chromatin remodel complex in place of anyone? That is a very interesting question, and uh, I haven't thought about it. That's uh, that, that I don't know actually, because you will have to replace the repeat, repeat one domain within anyone with this RNA structure and see how it functions. Yeah, it is to push the mimic to the extreme yes, now to see yes, whether it does exactly. Other no, things. That's Okay. Idea. Wonderful, thank yeah. you. Uh, very exciting talk. Thank uh, you. Interesting discoveries. So I have one question. Have you looked at the E1 level in the infected cells? Uh, does the level go up or down? So uh, we have done a little bit of uh, that studies. In the infected cells, it goes up very slightly higher, but not too much. Right. So, and it was not very significant for us to pursue further. Okay. Please introduce yourself before putting the question. So, this is uh, Indranil Banerjee from Isa Mohavi. Hi, Indranil. Hi. Hi. So, this is Arindam Mondol from uh, IIT Kharagpur. Hello. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, talk. Uh, congratulations uh, for doing such a wonderful work. Uh, so, my question is, um, what you have shown is if you are knocking out uh, the any one, the particle becomes defective. Also, uh, so it's the other way. If the any one is knocked out, there is not even particles. Particles are not even there. So it inhibits at a step which is earlier than particle maturation. So that means it is inhibiting at assembly level. Now, in terms of competing, is, is it supporting the integrase to interact with the uh, the tar RNA, or it is like uh, the other way? So, it's, whether it's a proviral or whether it's an antiviral. That's very good question. I have a model. I don't know whether I have time to go through it. Uh, so, basically, um, yeah, this is not it. I think I did not put the model together properly. But anyway, what we are thinking is that anyone is required to compete with RNA during assembly. So what happens is that, ignore this S6 because this is something else. What happens is that RNA is a very complex structure. It has the ability to bind to NC portion of GAG, GAG pol. And in addition to that, if it binds to integrase through this TAR region, then it will be a steric hindrance. Like imagine RNA binding to, to multiple regions of the proteins. Perhaps anyone binding, oh, what, what happened? Yeah, anyway, I think since we are running short of time, okay. we can have more detailed discussion during the lunch time. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Professor Kalpana. So we will talk about this. I have a model. Yeah, we can I have think it basically detailed discussion it. during lunch time. Yeah. So we will invite the next speaker, uh, Dr. Devas is uh, I think I know him as a body accidental virologist because he is not virologist by education but uh, he is working in this field, particularly the bioinformatics and a very important aspect, particularly for this viral hemorrhagic fever agents uh, like Kaiosnur forest disease, Alcumura forest hemorrhagic fever, then tick bone encephalitis, all these are actually select uh, threat agents, so which are the risk group 4 agents who will need the BSL-4 facility to handle these viruses. So in absence of this, he is really working on the in silico approach for predicting the candidate's targets for immune response against these viruses. Small Our request, request sir. Please. Sorry, sir. Small request. And sir, small request, sir. I request Chase to present small memo to the Professor Kalpana. Can do it in the last. Last. Yes. Okay. For all the speakers. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning and uh, thank you, uh, organizers, for this opportunity. So I'm going to talk about uh, immunoinformatics as well as computational biology approach to design a vaccine for an interesting virus which we just talked about, KFTB.
So I'll give you a brief idea about KFTB and it belongs to the heavy family. And these are the notorious viruses as we know, belongs to uh, three different domains. One is tick world, one is mosquito world, and others are unknown. Okay. So there are a lot of things to know for the students who wish to have a carry. And in this context, we have known dengue virus, Zika virus, TBEB, Alkmura, Castle first disease virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, hepatitis C virus, all these viruses which are making really problem and most of doesn't have a vaccine yet are belong to this category. And here we are talking about a virus called Castle forest disease virus. And this, as the name suggests that this is predominant in India, mostly found in India. Kashmir is a forest in Shimoga district of Karnataka and this virus was discovered in 1957, hence named after this Kashmir forest disease. And it's a flavor virus. All three viruses, Alpura, they are found in Asia and uh, certain aspects of Africa. It was found other than India. Now it's, it's not yet endemic in India. All these viruses are classical hemorrhagic fever illness and fatality rate is very high. Look at the virus. Uh, it's a small genome, 10 to 11 kb mostly, and it has two distinct domains, which are structural part, uh, this uh, the pipeline, as well as the non-structural part. And the virus makes a single polyprotein in the infected cell, and by the host proteomic cleavage, the necessary proteins are produced, and they assemble and do the necessary things. For example, the structural part will form the envelope of the viruses, non-structural part will I try to manipulate the immune system, also replicate the virus. So these two distinct parts of the viruses play its pathogenesis. So in the structural part, we have a, a typical protein called envelope protein, pre-membrane protein, and sometimes we have core protein depending on the context. So this is about that genome organization. So as I mentioned you that the Cassini forest disease virus exists in India. It is our problem. Nobody will make vaccines for you. So we'll make it sometime soon or later or not. But this is our problem and it is a genotic virus and BS level 4 viruses, limited ability of viral pathogens in the country and elsewhere, no commercial reagents to test it okay. and, and again access to the laboratory is limited, pandemic potential, okay. no money to work, yet we are going to start this work. Okay. That's the fundamental challenge that how can we do something around Casanova virus, can we make a you know, uh, mean to, to control the virus because this virus stays in the forest. Monkeys are and the rodents are primary host to support this reservoir as a reservoir and accidentally it comes to the human interaction or by tick bite and subsequently we get this uh, uh, you know, virus. Not only humans, also other animals can be infected. So it has a typical pandemic potential like the way we talked about the SARS coronavirus. Animal to human to animal, animal to animal to human, it can you know, grow in that chain and have this. Uh, and it is one of the top 10 deadly viruses. If you look at the typical viruses, Ebola virus, we talked about uh, uh, coronavirus, among the top 10 deadly viruses, this stands out. And the fatality rate is much high compared to flu or, or you know, corona or any such viruses. It's very, very uh, tough virus to occur. So, so these are the challenges. Based on force, no vaccine, no antiviral, no treatment, top 10, okay, no therapy, and limited ability of facilities, and uh, where we are going to work. Okay. So what we thought initially that, if you want to design a vaccine, it is uh, to look at this viral structure and look the viral envelope protein as pre membrane protein or envelope protein, make it as a virus-like particle, use it as a vaccine candidate. So in that quest, we try to make virus-like particle okay, uh, by expressing certain uh, you know, amount of envelope protein as well as pre protein in, in a cassette and try to rescue those you know, particles and we confirm these are the produced virus-like particles. Those who don't know virus-like particles, these are the self-assembled particles do not contain any nucleus, nucleic acid or gene or any such uh, entity inside. So they are very safe non-replicative and easy to handle and we don't require bs 11 4 or 3 facility or 2 facility to handle those things. Yet, they mimic the structure of the virus. They can be exactly immunogenic and can do a lot of you know, activity. You can study certain aspects of the viral biology by using these particles. Okay. So we use these particles and we also uh, you know, file certain uh, intellectual property rights to go around, make it as a vaccine panel. So what happened that? 
when you injected these particles and try to generate the antibody response, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, or what we can say, it produces a good immune response. But that does not, you know, solve our purpose because what we see that these particular antibodies which is produced by VLPs are easily cross-reacting with other private viruses such as dengue, as well as Zika, and also we have done with TBEV. So, which means that supposedly somebody is vaccinated with TBEV VLP, that person is going to be readily infected with dengue, or the person which is going to be infected by dengue some some year or later, it is going to be heavily infected by the KFTB. This, this is a uh, you know issue which exists in the in the small virus field. We call it antibody de dependent enhancement. So what happens in the antibody dependent enhancement? Instead of neutralizing the virus, the virus gets access to a antigen presenting cell, and inside that, instead of getting neutralized, it grows and produces more in number. So so the antibody helps growing the virus if it is not neutralizing. So if you inject this. Uh, particles, you may end up with a situation where you invite more infection in future than controlling or than protecting it. That is the precise reason why we don't have a yet successful dengue vaccine, which is not 100% successful. Hepatitis C virus vaccine is also not, not in the market. And TBEV, JEV, these are the questionable uh, vaccines which are available because of particular issue. To look at the many properties of the neutralizing aspects of these viruses, because this is basically four viruses, we developed our own serotyping system where we use the envelope protein of the KFTB in the backbone of VSB uh, as a serotyping virus. These serotyping viruses are very safe. They do not self-replicate, yet they mimic structurally to the parent virus so that we can study the neutralizing assays using certain neutralizers. But all the experiments tell that uh, these uh, VLP-based particles can be immunogenic, can produce antibodies, there are certain degree of neutralization, but they can cross-react with dengue or and Zika and so on and so forth, <coughs> which disqualifies for its uh, potential candidate vaccine use. To, to solve that issue, we took a pathway that how can we make a vaccine while avoiding this antibody-dependent enhancement effect, and it can produce protective immunity, list cross-reactivity to JEV, dengue, and other flavoring viruses, lasting humoral immunity, you know, then good CME or good memory. So these are quality of a good vaccine candidate and challenge is that how can we make it? So to, to do that, we took, uh, you know, help of computational biology as well as the structural immunogenetics to look at how can we design or where we can target this uh, structural aspect of the virus so that a precise antibody response can be done which will be very specific to KFDB alone and not disturbing others. So just to give a brief that this is the virus structure, we have uh, pre-membrane protein and you know, membrane protein and envelope protein, we call PRME, which is an protein. It has three distinct domains, the domain 1, 2, 3, and in that domain 2, we have a very small uh, place we call fusion. And this is a very interesting virus, So when the virus comes out from the cell, it has its uh, envelope protein, which is a receptor protein, but if the receptor protein is open, it will not come out because it will bind to the cell itself. So while coming out, it has a dimeric form, and the fusion loop opens, then when you touch the cell, it becomes a dimeric form. So that, that means that the virus is a very dynamic, in, out, in, out, there is a change in the structure of the protein, and in a particular fashion of time, the fusion loop opens, and if you target the fusion loop, probably you can target the protein of the virus to get in. So this is the, you know, our hypothesis that if something can target around the fusion loop, probably we can make a, you know, good candidate axis. So this is uh, the crystal structure of uh, another flavivirus because AMDB flavivirus is not sought yet and the crystal structure of the envelope protein is not available. So we did a lot of homology modeling to find out what we could learn from other viruses such as Zika, TBV to incorporate those ideas and try to make some things. So to start the uh, you know, process of human informatics, we looked at whether the structural proteins, particularly uh, present in flaviviruses and other proteins, are they sufficient immunogenic? Just to confirm, so we, we did that with the you know, help of server and we, we looked at, we found that you know both NH2B, which is non structural protein, as well as the structural protein, which is non protein, are highly immunogenic. So this qualifies that, okay, we can take this as a candidate forward for doing the immunoinformatics as well as the vaccine development work. 
We also map uh, the available sequences of KFDB, so it, you know, uh, yellow fever viruses, which is our another polyviruses, retinal virus, JEB, uh, Zika, and we look at what are the structural homology, in terms of sequence homology, exists. This is just a simple cluster W analysis. We can see that KFDB has a very interesting loops which is not present in other viruses. So similarly here it is absent, present in other viruses, and there are highly conserved domains all around it, which makes things that if you develop something on the entire KFDB amloprotein, probably it will also lead to produce similar ADE effect. So we have to be very careful that way to target. So as I mentioned to you that because the envelope structure does not exist in the database, PDB database, we model using homology modeling and we came up with the you know, structure as, as mentioned here. It's a dynamic structure in, in the one form and, and here we also mapped along with other like viruses such as Alcumura viruses, EBEB, and we looked at the structures very similar okay, and we overlap them and they are perfectly aligning which tells that Whatever you do with KFDB antigenicity or immunogenicity or vaccines, likely that will also impact other two viruses and vice versa. So we cannot work alone with the KFDB. Whatever you want to work, we have to work with the three viruses together, keeping the view that any effect should not be there. So these are some of the computational biology work. Most of you know homogeneous plots, to know the dynamics and styles in this generation assays, to know the quality of your structure, how it you know takes in milliseconds and seconds how it changes all these things which tells that our model is good enough to start with okay. also we looked at even if you use that uh, you know uh, envelope protein does uh, sufficient uh, you know overlap uh, HA or uh, epitopes present in the human MSC class 1 class 2 which can present it so this is a map showing that three viruses which are taking these are the population coverage telling that most of these epitopes can be presented by the human HLA or the MSC class 1s for the antigen uh, penetration process. Okay. Then we also did some of the simulation looking at whether those uh, anglo-protein epitopes can be really uh, docked to those MSC class 1 molecules or not. Now most of the stories are saying that okay, we have done that. Similarly, we also looked at the TBEB, other similar viruses looking at the docking data that where these epitopes are binding, whether the binding is proper or not. You have two, two more minutes to conclude. So we also look at uh, B cell epitopes based on certain analogy and modeling. So these are the epitopes which are linear epitopes. So some of you know that linear epitopes are the stretch of amino acids which can be presented as antigens uh, by the MSC class 1 and class 2. Similarly, we have also non-linear epitopes or discontinuous epitopes that can be continuously arranged to act as antigen or presented. So we, we model all these things around it and we just borrow some idea from the, uh, from the Zika virus structure which tells that a single antibody now which is patented which can target the fusion loop of the domain 2 can entirely prevent the virus infection. Okay. And when you model around or look at the fusion loop, we found that uh, KMTV, LKB as well as the TVG has a very distinct fusion loop which has a history compared to the glycine which is present in the other viruses. So now this is our single candidate that can we make a good antibody targeting this region so that it can be monoclonal, we can later humanize it or you can make it a humanized uh, mice, we can make it a human monoclonal antibody both for diagnostic as well as therapeutic purpose or can this epitope uh, based uh, you know, antigen be produced to sufficiently address the protection immunity, long lasting immune, immune response, and all these things. So, this is a working progress, and with that, I end here just to tell you that we are in the process of designing our BLP such a way that a targeted epitope will be immunogenically active, bypassing uh, the you know, other epitopes so that we have a precise monoclonal like antibody response. Later on, we can make a monoclonal antibody response to make a good candidate. So, with this, I thank. Uh, all of you for your you know, presence as well as for looking at uh, or listening to us. And this work done my postdoc, which is now in the USA uh, and supported by SOR and my collaborators who supported uh, this work. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, Dr. Javasis, for concluding the time. Now, this is open for a discussion.
Hi, thank you Devashis for the nice talk. This is uh, Milan from THSTI. I have a general question. You have shown a lot of uh, docking data. Uh, and you must be aware that uh, all these leaves lot of uh, background noise also. Yeah. So what are the different controls in the context of uh, deciding the immunogen that you have used to rule out any biasness for background noise? See, we have an assay where we are directly injecting the antigen to the animal cell to cut the cross That is one. I am talking about the in silico part. In silico part. We are changing the scores and you know, the base level and all these things. So what are the controls? Uh, that uh, I have to go back to, to the... So in generally speaking, uh, what can be the ideal control uh, in such are, case study? For example, we are taking a non-immunogenic part, which is being uh, likely targeted to be not present by MSC class and class 2. Uh, that way we are looking at it. Also we are looking at other viral uh, proteins which are typically presented, so as positive controls, to, to fit that talking score or not. And one more question related to that. So, when you talk about the epitopes which are uh, important for uh, immunogenic, uh, whether you are talking about linear epitope or both, confirmation? Both linear and confirmation. And how do you distinguish that in uh, silico study? Uh, we, we come with that, you know, three depths in model where we see that uh, particular epitope, for example, uh, this is a visual epitope where 